Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for the third of our four Liberal Arts Lunch and Learn presentations. Uh, appreciate you joining us today. Uh, my name is Bill Hessert. I'm the Director of Strategic Communications for the College of the Liberal Arts. And at this point, I would like to introduce today's moderator, Scott Bennett, who's Distinguished Professor of Political Science and our Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Studies. Um, Scott will be our moderator today. So Scott, I will hand things over to you at this point. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Bill, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a nice sunny day in State College, and I hope it is where you are too. On behalf of Dean Lang and everybody associated with the college, welcome to our third Lunch and Learn presentation, which is featuring members of, the, of uh, our liberal arts faculty who are studying different dimensions of the COVID-19 pandemic. To those of you who attended Tima's presentation two weeks ago or Kristen's presentation last week, welcome back. For those of you joining us for the first time, thanks for being here. Uh, this series has been a great opportunity for the college to highlight some relevant and current research that's allowed us to dive into understanding some of the specific facets of the COVID-19 outbreak. The series gives us a chance to think critically and thoughtfully about some issues that we may or may not be seeing on the news. And it's given us a chance to highlight the work of some of our long-serving faculty, like Kristen Buss, and some of our newest faculty, like Ray Block. So thanks for your interest in these presentations and thanks for your ongoing engagement with the college. If your schedule permits, I encourage you to join us next Thursday for the final presentation in our series that will have Barry Ickes, head of the Department of Economics, discussing the economic recovery from COVID-19. Barry's lecture will begin at 12.05 Eastern time. And I should note also that recordings of all four presentations will be available on the college's YouTube channel. If you have trouble finding those or accessing them, please feel free to contact Bill Hessert via email. His email is swh4, swh4 at psu.edu. And as for today, as we have before, we'll have time for questions following Ray's presentation. You're welcome to submit your questions anytime along the way using the uh, Q&A button that appears at the bottom of your screen when you scroll over. So those are our housekeeping items. Uh, with those out of the way, it's now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Ray Block. Ray joined Penn State just about a year ago as Associate Professor of Political Science and African American Studies. He joined us from the University of Kentucky, where he was Associate Professor of Political Science and African American and Africana Studies. Before that, he was a member of the faculty at the University of Wisconsin at La Crosse and Florida State University. Ray earned his bachelor's degrees in philosophy and political science from Howard University and his master's and doctoral degrees in political science from the Ohio State University. And Ray is not used to it yet, but Ray, every time someone mentions that you are from Ohio State, you will probably get teased about it. Uh, our alumni are very open-minded about many things, but where people come from uh, in, in terms of Ohio State is not always it. Uh, Ray also completed a pre-doctoral fellowship at Middle Tennessee State University. His research explores racial, ethnic, and gender differences in civic involvement, the formation of social identity and how it can change, and political campaigns and elections, among other topics. He's published dozens of book chapters, manuscripts, and peer-reviewed journal articles related to those areas of study. Most recently, he's co-author of a new book coming out this year titled Losing Power, Americans and Racial Polarization in Tennessee Politics. Ray currently serves as co-chair of the public opinion and political participation section of the National Conference of Black Political Scientists. He's an analyst for both the African American Research Collaborative and Latino Decisions, and is a faculty coach for the National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity. He's a member of several professional organizations, including the American Political Science Association and the Society for Political Methodology. So we're delighted, Ray, that you could uh, join us for this online session today to discuss race, politics, and the pandemic, how to mobilize for the 2020 elections. Ray, the floor is yours. Thank you. So I'm sharing screen now. Uh, 
not off to a good start. Hello, everyone. So to jump right in, what I wanted to do is I wanted to set the stage for how this presentation is going to work. And I'm in the storytelling mode here. So I'm going to tell you all a story about some stuff. I want to tell you a story about who I am and what I study, which is going to build upon the really great introduction that I just got. I'll also talk to you about how the pandemic, in my opinion, pulls the curtain back on race relations in the United States. And then we're going to talk about what the pandemic tells us about class, race, politics, and voting in a 2020 election. And I'm going to spend the most time on the third bullet point because I want the emphasis in this slideshow and this presentation to be about looking ahead. So on that note, who I am and what I study. For folks who don't know, TLDR means too long, don't read. And so I was trying to make a joke here, but the idea is rather than adding a lengthy discussion about my intellectual tendencies, I figured I would give it to you on a slide. So essentially everything that I do can be summarized as me being concerned with social identity and political involvement. Social identity can be a lot of stuff. It could be ethnicity, it could be gender, it could be race, it could be ability, it could be sexuality. It could also be political party in geographic region or anything that becomes a relevant way that groups of people tend to identify themselves and make decisions based on those identities. Now, political involvement, I usually study it looking at either psychological forms of political involvement, like, for example, interest in politics, which is what my dissertation was about, or looking at behavioral forms of political involvement like voting or protest. And we're going to talk about both during this presentation. So I said earlier, my dissertation was on political interest, and I looked at racial differences and how interested in politics black people were and white people were. And what I noticed is that generally African Americans were less interested in politics than whites were. But that changed in 2008, when lots of things about the political landscape became different. And one of those things is that Barack Obama was on the ticket during the 2008 campaign. And I started noticing that interest in politics, as we typically measure it using polling items, was changing so that African Americans were as interested, if not more interested, than whites were. And that interested me to study the presidency. So not officially, but I've started becoming a presidency studies scholar of sorts. And a lot of the research I do looks at the Obama and Trump presidency. And I also do some work looking at first ladies and have several pieces that are published about first ladies and social identity and how that works too. Now, in addition to all of that, I have always been fascinated with state and local politics. And while I was a pre-doctoral fellow at Middle Tennessee State, I started a project with a mentor of mine looking at race and politics in Tennessee. That project set a while as me and my co-author pursued other things but we finished a book this year. And so I wanted to make sure that was mentioned as a major research area for me too. And a new area of research for me is on the subject of police violence. Unlike most studies that focus, for example, on racial biases and the outcomes of police violence, for example, whether black people are more likely than their white colleagues to be treated unfairly by the criminal justice system. My work looks at perceptions of police violence. In other words, whether people believe officer-involved shootings or isolated incidents are part of a broader pattern. So all of this stuff together comes together for this work that I'm doing now that I'm talking about with respect to the politics of the pandemic. So race relations and the pandemic. So the pie charts here illustrate that black and white people's experiences with, with the coronavirus, which from now on I'm gonna say COVID-19 are. And so the pie chart on the left records whether or not a respondent has a friend or family members who have gotten sick or who have passed away because of COVID-19. And likewise, the pie chart on the right side of the slide shows the same thing except looking at white respondents. Something of specific interest to the alumni crowd is that in Pennsylvania, African-Americans comprise roughly 11% of the state, yet they account for 20% of the confirmed cases of COVID-19 deaths. And in the surveys that I'm showing you here, the fact that people are responding yes to these questions just upsets, upsets me and unsettles me in a lot of ways. And so we are having what I'm going to say collectively negative experiences when it comes to health in COVID-19. In terms of racially disparate economic outcomes, because of COVID-19, Black people are taking major hits both to their health and their wealth. And the overall unemployment rate fell to 13.3% in May, which is a good thing. But 
that's the, the encouraging thing about that gets eclipsed by the fact that if you sort the information by race, things look a little more grim. For example, the unemployment rate for white workers is 12.4%. And that's really high, but it's not nearly as high as the unemployment rate for black workers, which is like 16.8%. For Hispanic workers, which is currently at like 17.6%. If you combine the results from the last slide talking about health outcomes, with the slides here, the story is pretty clear. The pandemic has intensified already existing inequalities between Black America and white America. All right, so looking ahead, we're now talking about the upcoming election. I found this poll looking at the, this is the Kaiser Family Foundation poll done last month. And I love it because what it does is it gives people the opportunity to tell us what they think the major issues are that will be ma making um, an impact on their decision to vote in a 2020 election. And reason why this is important to me is because if you focus on the set of bars at the top and at the bottom of this figure, what you'll see is that compared to their white colleagues, more than twice as many black people say that the pandemic is one of the most important issues factoring into their decision to vote in 2020. Likewise, if you scroll down and look at the bottom of this slide, there's roughly a 10% difference between blacks and whites when it comes to the percent of respondents in that survey who mentioned the economy or healthcare as most important issues. When the issue is the economy, white respondents outnumber black respondents when it comes to them listing it as a major issue. And when the issue is healthcare, Black respondents outnumber white respondents when it comes to them mentioning this to be an important issue. Looking at a series of questions that ask about the government's response to COVID-19, this slide has a series of clustered bar graphs describing how responsive certain government officials have been to the pandemic. There's a lot to look at here, so I recommend you pay attention to the green sections of these stacked bar graphs. And the green stuff shows the percentage of respondents who believe that a particular elected official is doing a poor job responding to COVID-19. The biggest racial gap is on the left side of the series of bar graphs where more African-Americans compared to their white colleagues report that they believe President Trump is doing a poor job. Now, this particular set of statistics to me gets a little better context if we look at it over time. So what I do here is I take the percent of people who believe that Trump is doing a poor job. And I plot it out over time. So there are a handful of surveys that I was lucky enough to get access to that allowed me to sort those survey questions by race. And I'm reporting that information here. Now, it should be hardly surprising, but criticism of Trump's handling of COVID-19 divides up in ways that you would expect. And so in this case, Black people are becoming increasingly more critical and white people are holding relatively steady, but I also think it's worth noting that in these surveys that I was able to get my hands on, nearly half the white respondents also think that Trump is not doing a bad job. In other words, it's, um, the opinions seem more divided than they are among African-Americans when it comes to how clearly people believe that the president is not doing a good enough job to manage the pandemic. So when it comes to COVID-19, there's clear evidence of what I'm gonna say is racially polarized job approval. So the pandemic forces us to consider the relationship between the federal government and non-national levels of government. In other words, it forces us to think a little bit about federalism and how those relationships play out. To look deeper into these ratings for state level officials, I sorted responses to a question about job approval as it relates to the pandemic by geographic region. And these results here are only for the African Americans that we were able to pull from a survey that I recently did. So the story here is very limited to that group, but I think it's an important story to tell anyway. And that story is that ratings are the most positive or at least the least negative out West and in the Northeast. I would argue these are places where governors have taken a more gradual and perhaps more science informed approach to managing the pandemic. Conversely, respondents from the South, where pandemic management pros, I guess, approaches tend to prioritize boosting the economy over flattening the curve, 
are noticeably more critical in their ratings. Now here we're looking at some candidate preference stuff. And like before, I'm showing you some pie charts. This time what I did is I have the survey that I recently did on the left-hand side of the slideshow. And then I have some national averages across a whole bunch of polls that was compiled, sorry, compiled by realclearpolitics.com. And one narrative that interests me at this point is Biden's polling numbers among African-Americans. It might be tempting to think Biden's got it in the bag when it comes to the fact that he's got as many voters siding with him currently. But honestly, I think it's too soon to draw that conclusion. As the thing that you see here suggests, we also ask respondents to pick their preferred candidates in terms of, I'm sorry. Anyway, what I'm saying is um, if you look at the left side of this, the fact that Joe Biden's getting like 75% of the black vote is not as good as it might seem if you look at the right side where the national average is or that the race is more tight between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. I'm gonna argue later in Q&A, and I'm hoping this comes up to give me a chance to speak more about it, that Joe Biden's numbers here need to be at least in the 90% range for him to have a chance at winning the election. But it's also worth noting here that right now, Joe Biden is edging out Donald Trump if the horse race results are to be trusted. Now, this is just a question that was asked to African-Americans, but I think it's an important question because I'm talking about candidate preference and that presupposes that we're interested in what's gonna happen when there's an opportunity to vote. This bar graph has information from a survey question that we used in a survey that I recently ran last month. And it asked respondents to say whether or not they believe that the pandemic is gonna slow them down when it comes to going out and being politically involved. And given the need to stay healthy and safe, of course, that's a concern. So the concern would be that will we expect turnout to be what it can be in light of all of the things that will be depressing the vote or possibly depressing the vote. And we don't find evidence of that, at least not in the intentions of the respondents we found in our survey. To bring this point home and show you this information in this slide, I wanna say that the story that I believe that the information collectively from this presentation suggests is that on the one hand, COVID-19 is terrible, it's disruptive and it's dangerous. And on the other hand, the pandemic does not seem to be stopping black political mobilization. And I feel like this is an important time, so it's not like we can avoid discussing the protests, especially as they relate to what's going on here. So bear with me while I show a brief video. My name is Ron Filipelli, I'm the mayor of City Hall. I think everyone here should commit to staying away from the park. My name is Lamar Stevens. I feel like I could have stayed with the facts. I was going to my best friend win this past year. I think the first thing we need to understand is the fight that we're fighting. It's not black versus white. It's not black versus Asian. It's not black versus Indian. It's not black versus Spanish. It's everybody versus racism. So as I stop this, and I'm assuming that I'll probably get a chance to talk more about this, but a question I get a lot from the people I know is like, why protest, right? And I get it. And the reason why this is such a tense thing is because there are several things going on right now. There's this fight for racial justice happening at the same time that a pandemic is taking place. But protests have their purposes. And as a person who studies political involvement, I know this very well to be true. And to assume that protests are ineffective or perhaps ill-timed, I think is unfair to the moment. Arguably, I would say that every major moment of racial progress that African-Americans have had in the United States has been viewed at some point as an act of subversion in some way, shape, or form.
Why is that the case? Because race relations in America, I believe, are best characterized as conflictual rather than harmonious. And the Black people who are protesting right now, or anyone who's protesting right now, is making a decision to change the status quo. I am willing to face certain conflicts. I think what the pandemic makes very clear is that for many African Americans, the idea is this. If I go with the status quo, then I too need to be prepared to face certain conflict. So putting all of this together and moving forward. Remember, I'm a person who studies politics. And so I am interested in this moment that we're in. And this is anecdotal stuff, but we have white people protesting along black people, and this is happening worldwide. Ditto for the Navy and the Air Force when it comes to NASCAR and all three of these organizations are, that are banning and distancing themselves from Confederate monuments. And we recently had an NFL commissioner on TV talking about how Black Lives Matter. I'm curious, of course, to see how owners respond to that. But all of this stuff translates into us being in a very interesting time. And I think the candidate who's able to seize the momentum on this period of time will be the one that's successful in 2020. I have a really great appreciation for getting the chance to do this research and to share it with you. And I look forward to hearing some of your questions. Great, thank you, I appreciate it. Um, so again, everybody, please feel free to enter your questions in the uh, Q&A uh, window box at the at the bottom of your uh, bottom of your screen. So let me ask a broad question about the economy before we get into mobilization and counter mobilization and some of what you're speaking about. So often in American politics, we've said the economy is what drives an incumbent winning re-election or not. When the economy is good, the incumbent gets a big advantage. Uh, when the economy is bad, they often tend to lose. You talked about multiple concerns that the respondents in your survey had, the economy, healthcare, and so on. So the economy is clearly not good. That has led some to say, well, clearly Trump is going to lose because the economy is not good. But this is a different moment, and it's very easy to shift responsibility away from the president to you know, an unexpected pandemic. Do you see that politics of sort of blame shifting? How do you, how do you see that working out in terms of the economy and this longstanding finding about economics and voting? And so can y'all hear me? Okay, so um, I was thinking about this a lot and I'm gonna go back to the results that I showed you earlier in the slide presentation about the disproportionate impact that the pandemic is having on people's economic outcomes. And so if you combine that story, that story with the idea that the economy matters more to white respondents than it does to black respondents, I have some other evidence showing that if you were to ask black respondents directly what their priorities are, are their priorities in favor of waiting until people are more safe before boosting the economy or getting the economy restarted and hopefully being able to mitigate whatever health damage will happen along the way. African-American respondents um, in a margin of 80% to 20% favor flattening the curve over boosting the economy, right? And I would imagine that that cuts along party lines too. I don't have the data to suggest it, but I do know the old saying that it's the economy stupid when it comes to how American politics and how candidate preference usually works. I think in an environment like this, being mindful of the fact that if you're trying to court the black vote, for example, the black vote's not pro-economy at the moment. If you are more concerned about having national appeal, then the argument's a little more split when it comes to boosting the economy or flattening the curve. I think honestly, if Trump wants to be successful in 2020, his focus should be, and I think it actually is, on discussions about the economy. And I think if Biden wants to be successful and part of his success hinges more so on recruiting black voters, I believe his rhetorical strategy would be to focus on healthcare and to focus on things related to the pandemic. And so I think we're gonna get a good test of the it's the economy stupid saying in this particular election cycle. 
Well, with your comment on Biden there, uh, why 90 percent? Uh, why is is 90 and not 75? Is it the Electoral College? Is it some other factors? Why does it have to hit that level? It's just been the way it's been for a while now. And so typically, and I'm not saying this is an exact science here, but typically Republican candidates for presidents get between 8 and 10 percent of the Black vote. In fact, if you look at Trump's numbers in 20. 2016, they were actually pretty similar to what other Republican candidates get. Biden has to get those numbers up if he thinks he's going to have a good chance at winning the popular election. And I'm not saying it can't happen. I just don't think that 75%, based on the polling evidence that I'm seeing, is anything worth being comfortable about for the Biden camp. And I would believe that it would behoove whoever's working in the Biden camp to really try to seize on the momentum of gaining support from Black voters. And what typically happens is because this stuff plays out in a race and party way, that Black voters may or may not consolidate around the Democratic candidate in a general election. What my data suggests is that African-American candidates have yet to consolidate fully around the Democratic candidate. And we need to see a 15% at least boost in those numbers before we can say so. So your poll data about intentions that, you know, I am not going to stay away from the polls, I think, or from, from the voter booth, it's really important for me to get there. There's a chance that that would be impacted if we have a second wave or a third wave of actual outbreaks and we have to have uh, mandatory shutdowns. How might that play out? I feel like this is a great time to think about the implications of other ways of voting. And so, this is this interesting time where there's a lot of delegation of the responsibilities of the pandemic to the states right now. But there's also a clear mandate at the federal level that is against any form of not show up in person voting, right? And I'm curious to see what, what entity prevails, right? So if it is up to the states to decide this stuff, and people in states that are hard hit by the pandemic, regardless of what background you have, I could see the pressure in those states being such that not voting in person has to be a viable option or a viable alternative. And because of the party gap in terms of how things that shrink the franchise influence turnout versus things that expand the franchise, influence turnout. It's unfortunate that this argument has become a partisan argument where you can almost predict that people on the political left are more in favor of having these options that don't include going to the polls themselves, right? And people on the right are less in favor of those options. And they're both talking about election integrity as their reason for why they support or not support these things. There's an interesting piece that was written by some UCLA graduate students and faculty members that have actually shown that on balance, male voting, mail-in voting as an option benefits everybody, regardless of political and demographic background. And I'm hoping that a message like that might be used, for example, in places where people are really hard hit by the pandemic, but still citizens want to find a way to express their political voice in November. I'm going to try to combine a couple of questions that we've gotten following up on Biden and, and poll numbers. So mm -hmm. what is it that is, so if turnout is so important, and crossing some, some threshold in particular states in particular is, is really important. What is it that is causing Biden support among African Americans or potentially other, other key voting groups? What's causing those numbers to lag? And you know, could something like the selection of a uh, black woman uh, vice presidential candidate really help him? Is it past comments that he has made? Is it distance from Barack Obama? What, what is it that might be influencing those lower numbers and what, what else could he be doing? So I feel like um, all of the above, right? All of the above combined with the fact that not a lot of black voters had Biden as their number one choice in the very beginning. Combined with the fact that this happened on the right. So like um, I can think of examples of Tea Party Republicans, for example, going into forms of conflict with what I'm going to call more mainstream Republicans, 
the Democratic Party right now is hashing it out with itself to determine what types of major stakeholders are going to be the ones that are going to hold sway in elections. And there's a more, what I'm going to call a mainstream camp to the Democratic Party. And then there's a more anti-establishment camp to the Democratic Party. Biden represents one of those camps. He's more of a mainstream candidate. And some argue that a mainstream candidate may or may not have a better chance of getting through the election. But some of this simply has to do with the fact that we haven't gotten to the convention yet. So the consolidation process hasn't really started yet, right? But the people who may not have chose Biden first need to be pulled on board for the Democrats. And I think some of those efforts are going to start in earnest in the summer, because by then we'll know which vice president candidate Biden's picked. And to the degree that him picking a black woman, for example, will make it any better for black voters, I'm actually not very sure. I know that him not picking a woman would be him going back on his word and that could have real electoral consequences. I, of course, would be very interested to see if he does pick a black woman and which black woman that person would be. But I'm not really sure if that's the thing that's going to cost him votes among black voters. I think it could cost him votes among voters in general in the Democratic Party if he doesn't make the right decision prior to the general election when it comes to who he selects, because whoever he picks, one of their jobs is going to have to be to get the establishment camp of the Democratic Party to get those supporters to get in line with the less establishment camp of the Democratic Party. So I'm interested in some of the evolving narratives and narratives that are going to continue to evolve about protest and the pandemic. So six weeks ago, we saw protests by largely white crowds against stay at home orders. Then three <laughs> weeks ago, we saw protests nationwide that were much larger and with much more diversity. Um, we, over the last month, we've seen states allowing the reopening of all sorts of public facilities. And predictably, we've got in some states, coronavirus cases are, are spiking again. Uh, there's, and that's potentially going to go on for a while. There's a lot of places that you could place blame for increasing coronaviruses. Is it protest A, protest B, is it reopening? Um, how, how is that blame going to be placed? Is it just going to be in the eye of the beholder where you think the blame is? And so if you are uh, opposed to Black Lives Matter, that's what's at fault. If uh, you're opposed to something else, that's where it's at fault. How is that going to evolve and how is that going to affect what we see coming up? So I don't know how it's going to evolve, but I know how it could evolve, right? And so one of the major things that me as a political scientist has been sort of contending with, because I'm thinking about this both in terms of health outcomes and in terms of economic outcomes. And I'm not an, I'm not an economist, nor am I in the medical field, right? But the fact that narratives about the pandemic have been politicized is the issue. And those narratives are going to continue to be politicized in the near future. And so, like you say, so in column A, you have the earlier protests about being sheltered in place. Column B, you have the protests for racial justice. And then column C, you have the fact that more people are simply out because the, econ the economy is opening up slowly but surely, right? All of those things are definitely going to matter. And of course, you're going to see more cases, period. The politician who wants to do so can blame those rising number of cases on the second protest, if that's the thing that they think is going to influence their voters. Likewise, I can see a politician being successful in attributing the blame to the reopening if they believe that doing so is going to be something that's going to benefit them with their voters, right? It's yet to be seen what the Biden camp is going to do at the moment. But the Biden camp has told itself, well, I guess has given a tell, if that makes sense, that they're focusing a lot of their narrative on the mismanagement of the pandemic. While the Trump camp, I guess, if you want to say is campaigning now, has shown itself to be very interested in talking about influencing the economy and talking about getting the economy back on track. A getting the economy back on track narrative can't have as a blame the economy. You know what I mean? 
So it would have to go elsewhere when it comes to thinking about what to attribute the rising cases in. Likewise, if Biden is talking about the health of people and trying to push health care, then the attribution to this stuff probably shouldn't be to BLM. And they're talking about racial injustice, like it would have to be somewhere else, right? So I can't predict exactly what's going to happen, but given the circumstances you've laid out with these three places where you can attribute blame, I can see a political message on either side. And I can see those messages predictably coming from the Democrats versus the Republicans. And that partly fits with this next question. So we, we sometimes talk about national opinion. And so when I'm saying, you know, the narrative, you know, there's different people are picking up different narratives. Um, but we, we do have the Electoral College. And so somebody cynical or maybe realistic might say the election is going to depend on six states. I mean, maybe it's 10 states. It's not going to depend on 50 states. So how do our observations about national patterns and national trends fit or differ from the fact that, you know, a campaign really needs to focus on a smaller set of uh, uh, possible voters in particular geographic areas? I've always thought that 2016 gave us a great way of rethinking that idea, right? And so, yes, the Electoral College is set up so that ultimately the state decides what the popular opinion was, right? But we do, we do collect information about the popular vote. And I felt like there was this great urban-rural divide in 2016. And it was such that if you looked at an electoral college map, you would see something. And then if you looked at a demographic map, looking at urban areas versus rural areas, you would see something else, right? I am not sure which candidate is the most exciting to their voters. And that's different from 2016. So in 2016, you had this thing where people were, I guess, somewhere on the excitement scale for Clinton and people were just really interested in positive ways or negative ways about Trump, right? Trump as a firebrand meant that he inspired feelings in people that a more safe candidate probably wouldn't be able to inspire. I'm not sure if Trump still has that firebrand inspiring feeling going on in the folks that voted for him and whether or not the folks that are contemplating voting for him are as excited as they would have been maybe in 2016. Likewise, I can see Democrats not necessarily being extraordinarily excited about what it is that they have to contend with when it comes to their pick. And so I'm curious to see how mobilization works, because I feel like all of this stuff hinges upon how well mobilized the members of the two political parties are when it comes to getting voters to come to their cause. And right now, if you're looking at the horse race stuff, Trump's got his work cut out for him. Whether or not that's true in the summer and whether or not that holds up in the fall is one thing. But right now, people are making arguments that Trump needs to work a really, well, needs to work really hard to ensure not only the popular, but also the electoral vote coming up in 2020 based on the way demographics play out. Certainly the rhetoric out of the uh, Trump campaign so far is that they're doing great and uh, uh, some national numbers don't reflect that. So I guess we will see what's what's real and what is the spin that any candidate would put on put on their numbers um, so we've seen in in polling a significant rise in public support for the black lives matter movement uh, one of one of our one of the folks in the chat said uh, you know ABC News polls was 45% support a few years ago and 75% now. I'm sure we'd get different numbers in different polls. Has that support, uh, rise in support due to the Trump presidency and a reaction to it? Or is it a reaction to George Floyd's death uh, and, and accompanying recognition of issues? What would you attribute that to? Or do you have a guess? So I really don't know. Like, um, and I'm not ashamed to say that. I feel like everything that you've mentioned could be a factor, right? So it could be that we spent a lot of time indoors looking on screens and those screens were either TV news shows where those screens had things in your Twitter feed or in your social media feed, right? And you're seeing information that shows you things that allow you to contemplate race relations in the United States in ways you may or may not have contemplated them before, right? And you also have this pandemic, which makes people unable to do what they normally would want to do. 
And I can't give you the quote for it, but I remember seeing a poll suggesting that Americans are more dissatisfied now than they've been in decades, right? So there's, a, there's this feeling of dis-ease right now in the country combined with this feeling of concern about a pandemic that's going on, combined with this feeling of economic instability, which is actually founded by the data going on. And all of that stuff is coming to a head in such a way that we are starting to see real conversations being had about racial progress, but it's only May. I'm sorry, it's only June. And I do believe that we need to spend some time thinking about whether or not these upticks in what appears to be racial tolerance are stable changes or as opposed to them being temporary changes. And the racial politics scholar in me is going to stay skeptical about all of this stuff until more data comes out on it. And so I'm not even sure if these trends are lasting at the moment, but I know that this moment is very important. And I do know that politicians who seek to take advantage of this, and I'm just gonna say it, there's that political saying like, don't let a crisis go to waste, right? I could see a candidate actually pushing for a more racially progressive agenda in this moment than she or he would otherwise do because it's less costly to do it now or perhaps more popular to do it now. And if a candidate pushes forward and if legislation gets passed in favor of it, then we get net positive changes with respect to race relations because of what's going on. Okay, thank you. Let me go back a little bit to your comments about voting and turnout and mail-in voting. So you suggested that um, some sort of remote voting is really beneficial to everybody. Mm -hmm. But clearly the parties seem to differ on who wants it. And you know, clearly the Democrats think it will favor them. The Republicans think it will not favor, favor them. So how, how can we say it benefits both? Well, that's the thing. So this is a study that actually looked at whether or not the, well, the narrative is one thing, right? The study, the whole point of the study was to influence the narrative, right? So like, think about it another way. Think about it in terms of states, right? So I am from a state that's being hit really hard by COVID-19. And the state that I'm from has voters in it that really do want an option for a non-in-person voting arrangement in the fall. And the constituents are so fired up about it that it might be costly for the state level officials to not do something like that, right? And so like there's the national narrative about this and there's some historical precedent to that national narrative where the Republicans would like things to be more textbook run and the Democrats would like for things to be more expansive, right? That's a national narrative, but I'm not really sure how persuasive that national narrative is gonna be in a pandemic moment when states are giving so, given so much latitude to figure out what it is what, that they need to do to manage both their pandemics and the elections going on. And of course, we're watching the news. And so Georgia gives us a great example of what happens when people are upset about not having, for example, a mail voting option, and they're on their smartphones filming it and bringing national attention to something like this. And the national attention can actually become part of this equation where people on one side want to expand it and people on the other side want to keep it the way it is. That might give one answer to this next question, which is do you have any advice or thoughts to what we might do within our local communities if we do want to expand voting or expand our normal get out the vote campaigns in a time of COVID-19? Clearly you're analyzing some of the data from a, a step away rather than being on the ground. Um, but do from, from some of what you're talking about with the attention and so on, would that suggest something to, I'll say activists, but anybody who wants right. to undertake some kind of action in this, in this space, something that we can play off on, say? Well, we're all educators and um, I feel like information is really important. So I, for one, had to learn how things worked in the state of Pennsylvania because I hadn't been here very long. And once I found out how things worked here in the state of Pennsylvania, I kept bugging people to let them know exactly how things worked in the state of Pennsylvania so that others would be informed. 
And PA allows, at least currently, PA allows you the option to submit ballots via mail. But you have to, um, I feel like one of the things that we can do that's local and it doesn't really seem like a huge thing, but it is actually a huge thing, is to be willing to share information because the information isn't always easy to get access to. And us folks who are professional researchers sometimes take for granted how good we are at getting access to information. And so if people in your neighborhood, for example, aren't 100% clear on how the voting rules work and about where the process leads, then we can actually be in a position to help out with that. And that alone will do a lot to get people prepared to be involved in the fall. Whether or not they are or are not you know, involved in the fall is something else. But at the very least, we can work in terms of preparation. And I'll admit, as a political scientist, I value political involvement. And so regardless of party identification, it is my goal to help people to be politically involved if they want to be politically involved. I think I'll ask uh, one more one more question, and and this uh, you can take this in a couple of different directions. Um, you focused a lot on uh, uh, African American voting and race and, and politics here in particular, but the you know we know enthusiasm and turnout among a lot of different groups can drive elections. So does the pandemic? Do recent protests? How is that going to affect other demographics potentially in terms of their turnout, in terms of their interest? Will this have spillover effects potentially? Or is this you know, limited to the set of folks who are specifically interested in, in race and justice? I am really curious to see what the general election for 2020 is going to teach us about gender politics in the USA. Right, and so, there's clear evidence of a gender gap in terms of party support. But even that's racial. I mean, I'm trying to get away from it, but if we look at the, 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 gender, the alleged gender gap in terms of party identification support, a lot of that's also driven by race. If you look at it, Black women are enormously supportive of the Democratic Party. Black men less so, but still really highly supportive of the Democratic Party. And the differences almost disappear among white voters when it comes to the gender gap and party support, right? And the fact that it disappears says that it's on the edge. It's almost a split between women and men when it comes to supporting Republican candidates. But women are the largest voting bloc in the country right now. And I'm curious to see how these things play out in terms of the mobilization of women voters going forward into um, going forward into the election and what that means for outcomes, not only just at the national level, but looking at some of these down ballot election races that are going on too. Yeah, down ballot is something that we haven't talked about at all, and I'm afraid we're gonna we're not gonna be able to talk about it uh, uh, now. Uh, I think we're out of we are out of time. Um, Ray, thank you. Uh, I, I really appreciate all of the the time and the uh, the research and in the presentation and in taking all of our our questions. So thank you. And uh, thanks to the audience for being here and sending all of your questions in. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to quite all of those, although we we did get to a lot of interesting things. Uh, final reminder that our uh, last talk of this series is next Thursday, June 25th, 12.05 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Barry Ickes will be talking about economic recovery from COVID-19. Um, and with that, I think we will wrap it up for today. Again, uh, thanks everybody for joining us. And Ray, thanks so much for taking your time on this, on this lovely day to uh, spend with us. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Have a great day. Take care. Bye, everyone.